attained stardom because he was in such a big picture. Usually there was just Babe and Stan and a few people, but to walk onto a set and see hundreds and hundreds of people was really something. Maybe it is the film in which Roach felt that uh, uh, it was no longer one big happy family where they were all on the same wavelength. Uh, and who's to say who, who would have been right in that matter? Uh, uh, Babes in Toyland is a wonderful film, as, as is. Uh, and of course, the, the storyline they ended up with was one that Stan uh, worked on. What do you think of that? Pipple. That's the silliest thing I have ever seen. Try it. I don't want to try it. Why, can't you do it? Well, certainly I can't. What do you mean, can I do it? Give me that stick. Get over there. It's a certainty that anything you can do, I can do. Uh-uh. What, for instance? Uh, Laurel and Hardy had had a contract uh, problem with Hal Roach in 1938. They were always under separate contracts. They were never under contract as the team Laurel and Hardy, which worked to Hal Roach's advantage because uh, when he had one under contract, he could get the other for a lower price than he might otherwise get. And finally, in 1938, the uh, boys decided to put up a united front, and Stan elected to uh, wait out for about a year and a half and wait until Hardy's contract was finished. Both the guys were getting old. I mean, they, they were a bit in, you know, I mean, they were getting to the point where they got wrinkles and gray hair and so on. And uh, it was going to be, no matter what happened, they were only going to be good for a short time longer. In 1939, Hardy's contract with Roach finally expired, and uh, after a period of negotiations, Laurel and Hardy eventually signed two more separate contracts, but at least at this time, they both ran for the exact same period. They didn't terminate at different times of the year. So it was the next best thing to having a contract uh, as a team. The same day that Laurel and Hardy signed their new contracts with Hal Roach, uh, they were loaned out to an independent producer by the name of Boris Morris, where they made a film called The Flying Deuces. Uh, it's really the only film that Laurel and Hardy made away from Hal Roach that approaches the quality of the Hal Roach films. And that's because, to a large degree, Stan Laurel was involved in the writing of the film. There's a nice pickle we're in. Shot at sunrise. I hope it's cloudy tomorrow. Say, Ollie. What? Do you still want to come back as a horse? I don't care if I never come back. They knew it had come to an end. They, it, it, they had done their best. They really had. And it was changing. 
and the studios were changing. What I mean is, you know, you, it wasn't like the good old days where you just run and say, hi, fellas, come on, or let's go to lunch now, and it might be 10.30 in the morning, or it might be 2 o'clock in the afternoon. But everything was on schedule after that, and I think that uh, it was never the same old fun thing that they had had. When Laurel and Hardy went to 20th Century Fox and MGM in 1941, they came up against the motion picture studio factories at the peak of their powers. Uh, Hal Roach only made seven or eight feature films a year at the peak of his production, whereas Fox and MGM made 52 features a year. And there was a, a very strict schedule that had to be adhered to. And because of that, everything had to be written down in the script. And because of that, there wasn't the spontaneity that you had had in the Hal Roach films. They didn't buy Stan and his stories. They supplied their own writers. Well, that was dynamite. That just cut and stands through, you know. So he, he, uh, he lost his vigor and, the, and his enthusiasm, I felt, and, uh, and interest in, in the figures they were producing. I think they were in their kind of a down period. There was no joking, and, and don't forget, too, they were older from Hal Roach. This was like 40, 43. And um, they were quite uh, sedate and quiet. Because I don't think they felt, you know, that they were the big stars at the studio. Hey, you mugs. Uh, I mean, gentlemen. Well, well, it's Laurel and Hardy, as if I didn't know. Hello, boys. This is Pete Smith, as if you didn't know. Say, I'd like your help here for a minute. Do you mind? No, of course not. I just want you lads to show the audience how much wood the average person toasts. Wood. Got any? It's heresy no, to like say, God, but it's also true that there was a time with the advent of World War II when the style of comedy that Laurel and Hardy were offering was regarded as somehow passe. Now, in retrospect, we look at whatever momentarily eclipsed Laurel and Hardy during that period, and we can't imagine why anyone would prefer Abbott and Costello or whoever else was popular for those few years, why anyone would prefer them to Laurel and Hardy. You find just as much interest today in the old-time plastic material? I think that there, there is more interest, but there's so little of it done. That's true. I think that people want to laugh now, but they, they don't have the things to laugh at. <laughs> very, very true. And uh, people nowadays, they want to be connected with the higher type of, uh, uh, we might say, drama. Mm -hmm. They don't want to be associated with the comedy. Yet and they I, like to see it. It's because the comedy is difficult to make, you see. There weren't any further offers, at least at that time. So Stan wrote a 20 or 25 minute sketch, comedy sketch, and uh, their manager in London, Bernard Delfont, I believe he's Lord Delfont today, uh, booked them. And uh, in theaters all over the uh, British Isles. <laughs> It was an ironic consolation to Stan Laurel that his career had come full circle. From his beginnings as a boy comedian with Fred Carnot to the 